worthy for me to be in the house of the Lord. It's his grace and it's his goodness that is really being extended to us. God is giving us a chance to connect with him, to repent, to make things right, to worship him, to praise him. And, you know, it's like the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's more than just getting together. And I, I really, you know, I think sometimes people think, well, uh, I think it's a lie of Satan. One of the biggest lies that's been perpetrated on, on America. And that is that I believe in God. I can just stay home. I don't need to go to church. I'm a good guy. I'm a good woman possibly. And, and I'll, I'm good to go. And they think they, they take care of their families. And there's a lot of people out there that are nice people. And they pay their bills and they take care of their families. But yet they don't put God first. And it's a lie of Satan saying, I'm good to go the way that I am. I, I don't need to go to the house of the Lord. But this is what God has instituted in his word. That we get together, we worship together, we pray together. And people are just sitting back and dying and going to hell. But you know what? We need to get to the house of the Lord. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to pray for our communities. We need to pray for our country. They need Jesus in their lives. We don't have time for the lies of Satan. And so when you feel a little tired on the inside, get to the house of the Lord. I know many times I've been to God's house and I, I'm kind of tired, kind of wore out, maybe beat down from the world. But there's just something about it when you get there and you just lay it on down. You're, you're around friends and family and we worship and seek God together. And God by His Spirit begins to move in a mighty way. Next thing you know, that burden you've been carrying around begins to fall off. And you walk out refreshed and renewed in the Spirit of God. And that's exactly what we need. Amen? Amen. So I'm thankful that we can go to the house of the Lord and don't let excuses stop you from being in God's house. There are those that are working, those that are in the field, those that are deployed, whatever the case may be right now. But I told you at the beginning of the revival, excuses will come. And the devil will try to give you an excuse not to be here in the house of God. But the devil is a liar. Amen. Do you hear what I said? The devil is a liar. But our God is a God of truth. And the truth will set you free. Amen. Amen. Truly, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Truly, it is. Let's not give place to the devil. Let's just have another wonderful night serving God. At this time, the brother's going to come to help us to receive the, what is tonight? Tuesday. The Tuesday evening tithe and offering. All Christians pay tithe. If you had not had an opportunity to pay your tithe, this is a great night to do it. All right, put your tithe in a tithe envelope, put it in there. The offering will go to Reverend Diaz once again tonight. How many has enjoyed the services thus far? Amen. And he's just not preaching, saying things, pulling it out of a shoebox. He prays and gets a hold of God. And we appreciate that. And God's moved every night. God has blessed a special way every night. So we want to receive a good offering for him. The tithe does not go to the evangelist. The offerings do, all right? So let's receive a good offering. And this is his income. And, and this is how he manages to get here and traveling here and, and the gas. And you know things are not cheap and insurance because we're all in the same boat together. But we want to take care of him. Amen? So God bless you as you give unto him. Uh, the online giving is there. The QR code works. But as I told you last night, the cash app link is not working. Not yet, but we're making headway on that. So you give. God will bless you. Amen. Amen. Brother Ron, sir, please pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to give unto you. We thank you, Lord, for giving us the means to give us the portion of what you've already given to us. We ask the Lord to bless the gift and the giver according to your word. Jesus the precious and powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Praise the Lord. Thank you for your giving. May God bless you abundantly for it, and he will. Praise God. Amen. We're glad to have Reverend Johnson with us in service. Most of you know who Reverend Johnson is because he's been here uh, many, many times. And when I was pastoring here before, we kept him hostage for a couple weeks, all summer long. In the basement. And, and, and when I got here before, the basement was unfinished. It was just rafters and concrete walls. And he worked down there. He put all the sheetrock up and put the bathroom in down there. And it's really nice for us to have a Sunday school area. And we appreciate that. So general, he, he is our general overseer emeritus. And uh, we do appreciate him. And, and there's a lot of things we could share about Reverend Johnson. But let's just say that. What's that? It's good not to say it. It's fine to say it or not to say it. Sir, Santa, say something for the Lord, will you please? You can come up here if you want to. You can come up here. No, traveling is a pilgrim. On planet Earth here, we're all travelers. We're headed to work. We just so happy we're headed back home from the camp. And we stopped here. It's been a blessing. We thank the Lord for the opportunity occupy a spot in the parking lot and uh, thank God for, for Pastor Gandhi and Sister Gandhy and all the church members here. It's, it's, been, it's awesome how God has blessed uh, Fort, Fort Riley and uh, you know, along the way we need a place to rest. Amen. And I'm giving off of this rest stop and Jesus said, come unto me all ye and every lady and I will give you yes. rest. Yes. And a rest, that rest, there's an eternal rest. And we know the eternal rest is heaven itself. Amen. If there's a rest stop right now, in the presence of the Lord, a rest stop by the Spirit of God, and new birth, and saving, salvation, deliverance, and if you're talking about a real peace, a real rest, yes. God gives a man a real rest. And you thank God for that. That Amen. eternal rest. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and, and we go through things sometimes and, and people don't understand why we can still keep our composure and how things happen. It's because of this rest that Reverend Johnson was just talking about. And it's all because of Jesus and we want to give him the praise and the glory and the honor. Pray for, pray for Reverend Sister Johnson as they travel back to Aurora. It's a long way and we are glad, always glad to have him here. And maybe on one of these rest stops that he comes, we'll let him preach to us. Amen? So the invitation is there just so come on over. Praise God. Amen. Amen. At this time, Reverend Diaz is coming to preach to us. God bless you, sir. How many's had a good time? Yeah. Now, we're not, we're not tired yet, are we? <laughs> uh, should we just like, okay, I want to take that rest that we're talking about right now. Well, we have that spiritual rest, but let's not take that physical rest for at least another hour or so. Amen? <laughs> God bless you, sir. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Great to be here on a Tuesday night. Looking forward to what the Lord has for us this evening. Our Bible reading is going to be coming out of the Gospel of Mark. Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, starting in verse 20. It's the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, starting in verse 20. Thank you very much for your giving. May God richly bless you for that. Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 20. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these things I observe from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. And he was sad at that saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. Our text is coming from the same book, Chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. For what should it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? With the help of the Lord this evening, I'd like to preach to you on the title of a message, The Exchange Rate. The Exchange Rate. Pastor Gandhi, would you please pray? My gracious Father, we thank you once again for the opportunity we have to be in your house. Worship you and to glorify you. And Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do and accomplish in every heart and every life. Bless now the evangelist as he brings forth this message that you've laid upon his heart. And Lord, we look to you. 
Lord, we thank you for the promises you've given to us. We thank you for the salvation that we have in you. Bless now. Save the soul that is very hell, and we will be very careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. What is an exchange rate? It is a rate in which countries' currencies can be traded for another country's currency. For example, it takes 16.97 pesos to make up one dollar. Why is there an exchange rate? Because we cannot use currency from another nation in the United States. We will not accept pesos in the United States. Neither will they accept dollars in Mexico. Could you imagine working all week long, sweating for hours, working overtime, working hours that took you away from your family, took you away from your loved ones, took you away from your leisurely time, and you put all you had into that work. Then your boss comes one day and he pays you in pesos. You would be upset or at the least you'd be confused. You can't use pesos here. What good are pesos in America? I'm sure that the response, I'm sure that your response would not be, okay, I'm going to take these pesos and I'll just go and I'll try to make it happen. No, you would demand the proper currency for the country that you are in. All right. In our setting... This young man was looking for a foreign currency. He was looking for a currency that was out of this world. It was a currency that could only be bought in the kingdom of heaven. He was looking for eternal life. And here Jesus tells him the exchange rate. That if he would follow the word of God. That if he would obey the commandments that God had laid out. That he would inherit that eternal life. But this young man knew that there had to be something else. And he said, I've observed all these things from my youth. That from the very youth, I was taught to be religious. I was taught about the Torah. I was taught about Numbers and Leviticus. I know the law. There's got to be something else. And Jesus did not look upon him and frown upon him. But Jesus said he beheld him and he loved him. You know, sometimes the preacher will get up and say things that will plow your field. And you feel like, why am I being personally attacked? But it's not because God is against you. It's not because God hates you. But God will tell you the truth because he loves you. Jesus then told this young man the truth. He said, one thing thou lackest. This is when Jesus started to get to where he lived. He started to get personal with the young man and he started to tell him, one thing you lack, go ahead and exchange all these things and this is the exchange rate in order for you to get your treasures into heaven. And the young man was very sorrowful because he was not willing to make the exchange. In this man's mind, he was giving up so much for so little. This man did not understand the value of the treasures in heaven. He did not understand the value of his own soul. He did not understand that Jesus was trying to take him higher. That Jesus was trying to look out for this young man. That Jesus wanted this man to be in heaven. Jesus said, come, take up your cross, deny yourself, and come and follow me. You know, it's so much easier when we choose to follow Jesus. No matter what path in life we go if we're following Jesus we know we're going to make it to heaven someday but this man had the wrong idea or he underestimated or undervalued the treasures that are in heaven Jesus asked in a few chapters prior what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Tonight, I want to ask you the same question. What is your exchange rate? Or what will you sell for your soul? Before we get to that point, I, I want to give your soul an appraisal. I want you to understand the value of your soul before you make a decision on whether you're going to sell it for a lower price or whether you're going to give it to God. But before we do this, we must understand what makes an appraisal. An appraisal is an estimate 
given by an expert. And it's to make sure that we have the proper exchange rate. If you were going to sell your house, you wouldn't want to sell your house for a hundred thousand less than what your house is worth. You would want to have the proper appraisal. You would want an expert to tell you exactly how much your house is worth. And before you make the decision on the investment of your soul, I think it's only fair that you understand the value of the soul in which you possess. We are taught in economics class that it has received the greatest value that we must give our selling or whatever we're selling to the highest bidder. What are some of the factors that decide the value of the soul? Number one, longevity. The longer something lasts, the more that it's worth. If you had a dishwasher that only lasts three years, and you had a dishwasher that'll last you 25 years with a guarantee warranty, and they cost the same price, which one are you going for? Are you going to go with the clunker that's only worth three years? Or are you going to go with the one that's longer? Longevity is the first one. Scarcity of an item. To anyone who's a collector, we know the more scarce the item is, the more the item is worth. If there was only a limited edition comic book for all those comic book fans, those that possess the comic book have a very valuable piece of artwork. Why? Because it's scarce. You can't find it everywhere. Scarcity is another factor that comes into evaluating the soul. And number three, the cost. How much did it cost to make this item? What was this item made out of? Was it made out of cheap material? Or was it made out of something special? Was it made out of something valuable? Longevity, scarcity, and the cost are the three things that we're going to use to evaluate the soul in which mankind possesses. Longevity, your soul will last for eternity. Your soul was not meant to corrode. Your soul will never cease to exist. For it was breathed in the Garden of Eden, the breath of God into mankind. And that Spirit of God is placed within us. And the things that are of God are eternal. Why? Because God's eternal. God does not corrode. God does not weaken. But the Bible says He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that same breath of life that he placed into Adam when he gave him breath is the same spirit that we possess as human beings that God gave us something not that was going to fade away not something that was going to corrupt but he gave us something that was going to last forever while the foundations of the world crumble the souls of men and women will still go on does that mean the soul will never die no it doesn't mean the soul will never die But it means the soul will never cease to exist. Well, preacher, if it doesn't cease to exist, doesn't that mean it's immortal? No, because the Bible says that we could be dead for eternity and still have our soul. You see, the soul will go on to eternity, but the destination in which the soul will go depends on the person that owns it. It depends on the person that has the soul. Just like an automobile. An automobile may be built to go 500,000 miles. But if the owner of the vehicle does not do the proper maintenance, if it doesn't take care of that vehicle, it might only last 50,000 miles. And if it only lasts 50,000 miles, is it the fault of the manufacturer? Is it the manufacturer's fault because the person did not do the proper maintenance? No, it is not. So although God meant for our soul to last for eternity, it's up to you to maintain the soul. We can't maintain it by our own works. You can't do an oil change on your soul. But you can have a renewal. You can have a revival that the Spirit of God dwells back in. And that soul, as you were drifting away from God, you can say, wait a minute, I'm going the wrong way. Wait a minute, I've abused this soul. I've sinned against God. I've sinned against my body. And I need to make sure that my soul makes it into heaven. I don't want an eternal soul to go to the junkyard of hell. But I want my eternal soul to take me all the way to heaven not by works not by my own mind but because of the spirit of God and the blood of Jesus would not be the manufacturer's fault if the vehicle did not make it to the estimated amount of miles because the person abused the vehicle 
This leads us to our next point. Scarcity. The Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That there is only one of you. There used to be this saying, and I don't know if I'm getting to the age where I'm becoming old or not. But this saying used to be YOLO. Which was, you only live once. You only live once. And so many young kids would use that as an excuse to do stupid things. They would say YOLO and they'd jump off a cliff. They say YOLO and then they eat a Tide Pod. They say YOLO and they do all these dumb things. You know, if you only live once, wouldn't you want to take care of that one life you have? You only have one life. You only have one soul. And you are not made in a production facility where everybody's a carbon copy of one another. But the Bible says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are all stamped with the signature of our Creator. Our Creator is God and we are made in His image. Just like if you were to buy a Ford F-150 right in the front of the Ford, you would see the blue emblem with the signature that said Ford. It showed the manufacturer. It showed who was the creator of that vehicle. And when you see men and women and you look and you see that we are all created in the image of God, then we can all know, I know God made me and He made me beautiful. I know He made me a one of one and God did not create us just so we would die and corrode but God created us to last for an eternity how many people in the world today are told that they're an accident they're told that their life did not matter they were told that just because somebody made a bad decision that that's why they exist God's plans supersede the sin of man. Those man has sinned and tried to destroy themselves with war and weapons of war and the sin to corrode the flesh and the soul. That God's love and God's blood and God's plan is greater than what man has chose to do with themselves. The weapon that was formed against us shall not prosper if we're in the Jesus's, if we're in the love of Jesus. How many times the world will underestimate the value of a human life? We live in a society today where it is so easy to throw away the things that God has made. So easy for somebody to say, well, I didn't mean to have this pregnancy, so I'm just going to go ahead and throw this clump of cells away. They don't understand the value that God places on mankind. That we are God's most precious creation. And when man destroys man, it breaks the heart of God. To see that his own creation is destroyed by the wickedness of Satan. By the wickedness of mankind. They underestimate the value of the soul. We were produced with greatness. We were produced by the breath of God. You say, well, we were made out of dirt. Yes. But we weren't beings, we, weren't, we didn't have souls until God breathes his breath in us. You know, if God believes that we're precious and he's the creator of all things, he chose us above the mountains which are beautiful. He chose us above the beaches which are beautiful. He chose us above the animals like the tiger and the lion who are majestic in their own right. And God loves us more than anything else he created. And if God said you're valuable, then who are we to say that we could just throw men and women aside? But he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Why does the gospel matter to mankind? But because he wants the world to know that there is a great exchange rate, that you don't have to trade in your soul for simple pleasures in this world, that you don't have to trade your soul for the sin that will make you gripe the next morning, but we can trade in our sin for righteousness. We can trade in our hate for love. We can trade in those things that were meant to destroy us and allow Christ to give us a brand new life. What did the soul cost? We talked about the longevity of the soul. We talked about the scarcity of you only have one soul. But what did it cost? What did it cost you to have that soul? Paul said, Know you not that you've been bought with the price? What is the price tag of man's soul? 
How much is a soul really worth? According to God, the soul is priceless. The soul cannot be bought with filthy lucre. The soul cannot be bought with American dollar bills. Neither can it be bought with a Mexican peso. But it can only be bought by the blood of Jesus. You see, we forfeited the right to our souls because of our great, 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 great grandfather Adam. Because he traded in his soul for a poor exchange rate. He traded in eternal life for death and for sin and for pain. He traded in the perfect garden that he had to working with the ground that was going to work against him. He traded in greatness for sin. But because of the love and the grace and the mercy of God, God sent Jesus Christ to undo the work that Adam did. You see, Adam was a fool. Adam traded in his soul for something stupid. Something as stupid as knowledge of good and evil. But Jesus came down and born of a virgin. He was sinless. He was perfect. And he said, I'm going to go there and I'm going to buy back what mankind has lost. And I'm going to give mankind the power that if they would believe on me that they can have the power to be the sons and daughters of God oh what an exchange oh what a purchase that we can be free just by believing that Jesus Christ is the son of God and repenting of our sins this great exchange rate mankind sold it to Satan But Jesus said, I have the keys of hell and death. And this very evening, Jesus Christ holds all the power. Jesus Christ has the power to set you free. You say, my soul's been tainted. My soul's been disrepaired. Come to Jesus and let him fix your broken heart. Come to Jesus and let him fix that which is lost. Come to Jesus, ask for forgiveness. And you watch as Christ makes you a new creature. The mark of a Christian is not on the outward appearance, but the mark is the heart. The heart is what has changed. So many people can have an outside appearance where they look like a Christian, but that superficiality is not good enough to make it to heaven. There must be a change in the heart. There must be a change in the nature. And this evening, if you say, I've been coming to church for years, but I have not exchanged my sin for holiness, this very evening when the altar call is made, You can come and say, Lord, I'm trading in my sin. Lord, I'm trading in my depression. Lord, I'm trading in my anxiety. And you just watch as you get the greatest value out of your soul. With all these factors, we can find our appraisal of our soul to be priceless. There's nothing worth more than your soul. And Jesus asked... What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? So many people have sold their soul lower than market value. When we commit our lives to a life of sin and commit our lives to a life of treason against the Almighty, we condemn our very souls to hell. This was not the plan of God that man's eternal soul will end up in hell. So many people think that God is a mean and cruel God because people go to hell. But God doesn't send people to hell. But rather people choose to dive in head first because they're thirsting after their lust. The things that they desire bring them to chaos and destruction. But when we receive a new heart, like the David said, create in me a clean heart, O God. When he creates us that new heart, We have new desires. What is the number one desire of a Christian? To be like Jesus. We're all trying to be like Jesus. But we must trade in those things that so easily beset us. Paul said, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So many people try to live for God. 
but they also try to hold on to the world. He said to come out from among them, to be ye separate, to be holy as I am holy. He said you can't serve two masters. You either love the one and you hate the other. You cling to one and you despise the other. Who are you clinging on to this evening? Who have you sold your soul to? Have you given it over to the one who paid the price? Or do you think by somehow that you think you own the deed to your own soul? That's why Paul said, know you not that you were bought with the price? Do you think that you have the authority to sell your neighbor's car? Do you think you have the authority to sell your neighbor's house or to sell your children's house or your parents' house? Then why would you think that you have the authority to sell God's soul? It was purchased by blood. And if we give our lives over to God, we will surely have the greatest exchange rate. For we'll have treasures in heaven where the moth can't cr eat away, where the rust can't corrupt it, where thieves can't break through the home and steal. But the world is filled with people who are foolish in making their decision. And they choose to give up their souls for simple, stupid pleasures. They'll give up their soul for pleasure with the opposite sex or the same sex. They'll commit immorality against God and jeopardize the destination of their soul. Can you imagine if you gave somebody a very expensive gift? You worked so hard to be able to provide this gift. It meant so much to you to give it to them. And you worked for days and days and finally you purchased the gift and you were able to give it to your loved one. Then your loved one just looks at it and throws it on the ground as if it didn't mean anything. Throws it away as if it was worthless. Throws it away as if it was counted as nothing. Matthew 7 verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast your pearls before swine. Lest they trample them under their feet and turn again to rend you. How many people cast their soul before swine? They cast their soul to the world and they lose the very valuable thing that is priceless. Life is too short to waste my soul on the things of this world. Life is too short and eternity is so long it only makes sense to give God what belongs to Him. The soul will not cease to exist. But this evening, you have the choice on whether you can exchange your soul for righteousness and the things of God and eternal life or you can exchange your soul for worldly pleasures. God has given it to you and the choice is yours. The musicians may come at this time as we begin to close. What is the exchange rate for the soul? That's what we've been looking for this entire evening. And the exchange rate is whatever you're willing to give for it. Have you sold your soul for a world and its temporary pleasures? This rich young ruler sold his soul for limited things that would then burn up. Where is this man's riches today? Where is his money? Where is his wealth? It stayed here rotting on the earth and somebody spent his money. But his soul is still going on eternity. And unless that man made a decision later on in life and changed his ways, the only thing that we can assume is that he died and he went to an eternity without Christ. He said, store for yourself riches in heaven. This very moment, we can choose to invest our souls in Christ. Christ gave us the answer. In order for us to pursue, preserve our souls, we must deny ourselves, pick up the cross, and we must follow Christ. Your life is not your own. You may think you have the choice to do whatever you want with it, but don't rob God of that thing that He gave you. Don't rob God of the thing that is His. That soul belongs to Him. 
And this evening I implore you, if you have not given your life to Christ, if you have not surrendered your sins, if you're still living in wickedness, if you're still living in shame and guilt, this evening God is willing to abundantly pardon. He's willing to forgive you. He's willing to create a new life within you. He's willing to put you on a new path. He said He cast your sins as far as the east is from the west, that He cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. You know, your family may never forget the sin you committed. Your friends may never let you forget the sin you committed. But there's a God in heaven that if you're willing to repent, if you're willing to confess your sins, that He said He'll remember them no more. You can trade in those robes of scarlet and you can exchange it for a robe of righteousness. You can exchange your sins for eternal life. So I ask you one question. What will you give in exchange for your soul? The musician, you can start playing whenever you're ready, sister. Jesus Christ loves you. He loves your soul. He made you with the very best material. And He made you out of the image of the most precious person in the world. Jesus Christ did not come and die so you could live in your sin. But He died to give you liberty from it. Where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty. Will you make that decision today to give your life to Christ? Will you give, make that decision today to surrender your sin? Or will you go out the same old way and jeopardize your eternal future?